Hello guys and welcome once again to Level 3, your support centre for gaming, for gaming that won't be outsourced to India anytime soon. I'm Jamie, I love all things Sony, Sony PlayStation, PSP, the whole thing. But Level 3 would be proportionately less flatulent if I wasn't joined each and every week by this man to help me out. I'll tell you now, you don't want to be on the pointy end of one of his rants. His tongue is as acidic as the contents of a barrel in a bank vault. And I think it's safe to say that he's bigger than Michael Jackson and Robbie Williams. Robbie Williams put together, if we're talking centimetres cubed. He is a gaming genius. His name's Jason. The guy, <laughs> the guy with laryngitis today. So, he's not going to be saying, he's not going to be saying much today. So, I tell you, it's going to be a magnificent episode. He's saying less than, uh... that's right, that's right, it's going to be a long and eventful episode. I can, I can read sign language, this is great. Let's check out what he did have to say about Lego Star Wars back when he had a voice. Now I'm going to take a chance now to give you guys a bit of a history lesson. Yes, even though my voice is crackly, I'm still going to do it. I'm going to sound like that condescending old teacher that everybody hated at school. In the 1940s, there was this little thing called World War II. Now in World War II, the Allies, which was America and, and Britain and Australia and plenty of other countries, fought these people called the Nazis. Now the Nazis were based in Germany. Um, and what the Nazis did was a lot of bad things to this group of people called the Jews, right? Now, unfortunately, today's society doesn't seem to think that Nazis are worth mentioning. The reason I bring this up is because I'm reviewing Lego Indiana Jones, and not once in Lego Indiana Jones do you see a Nazi. Now, this might be okay if we're dealing with, you know, politically correct land, but we're not. This is Indiana Jones. This guy spent pretty much all of his entire life either punching Nazis or doing something to Nazis to stop them from you know, stealing the Ark of the Covenant or whatever the case may be. So for them not to be in there, it's nearly sacrilegious. And that's weird saying that about the Nazis, but come on, seriously, we've got to teach the kids eventually. Now, to, about the actual game, Lego Indiana Jones is very similar to the Lego Star Wars series. You've got the whole... You know, Zomga, they're cute, they're Lego. Um, and it's a very irreverent kind of take on the series. Instead of being very serious, um, like Indiana Jones and the um, the, the one on the Xbox was, it's, it takes a very kind of irreverent kind of view to it. Like, uh, a lot of the cutscenes are exaggerated, um, a lot of slapstick humour and stuff like that. And a couple of throwbacks to uh, Lego Star Wars, like in the Nepalese scene, you're in a, you see an ice cave, and there's um, a guy in a white suit with goggles hanging upside down trying to reach for a lightsaber, which of course is a throwback to, uh, to Star Wars. So it is, there's a lot of fun to be had. It's very irreverent, very childish, you know, run around, bash the things and stuff like that. It just doesn't do enough to, to make it worthwhile. Like, platformers can still be fun and challenging at the same time, and this really doesn't even fall into the challenging category. I mean, anything you lose when you die, you can pick back up anyway. So it doesn't really challenge the player to do it. But... That said, for the kids, if you're buying it for the youngsters or whatever the case may be, no problem. It just for the Indiana Jones nuts, you have to be a real big fan to to get to to even think about picking this one up. Um, so I'm going to get down to some scores and I'll explain my my logic in, in a bit. The visuals now, the visuals is a Lego game. It's not I can't really compare it to you know the Call of Duty fours of this world or the Gears of War of this world. It's unfair. Uh, that said, it's it's bright, it's colourful, it looks nice. Um, it does all. It ticks all the right boxes. Um, it just, as I said, plays it a little bit too safe. Um, you know, the, the visual flares lacking a bit. Some of the clipping issues are pretty bad. So, the visuals, I guess I'm going to give. I mean, comparing it to everything else and and the way that it's actually meant to be, I'm going to give it a six point five out of ten. Now, the sound, there is no real sound. It's all the conversations consist of. <laughs> So there's no real sound. I mean, the sound, of course, comes from the cutscenes and the screams when you're doing stuff and the music. So in that sense, I guess it's good. But I don't know. I guess it exists enough for it to, to be considered, you know, worthy of a score. But so I'm going to give the sound a four out of ten. Now, it's not looking good so far for Indiana uh, Lego Indiana Jones, but it's it's not all that bad. The gameplay, as I say, very simple, very basic kind of gameplay. Um, but it's not, as I say, it's not exactly challenging fair. I mean, you know, Super Mario managed to be vibrant and exuberant, but still provide a, a real challenge, you know. It's the same with, you know, plenty of other, you know, Ratchet and Clank, stuff like that. They still managed to have that, 
you know, they kitsch vibe, but they they were real. They were still real gamer games when it came down to it. Uh, Lego Indiana Jones is not that game. If you're looking for a bit of fun with a girlfriend or a kid or whatever the case might be, run out there and pick it up tomorrow. But if you if you're looking for something a little bit more, uh, I don't know, challenging, yeah, this isn't your game. So gameplay. I'm going to give a 6 out of 10, so it's probably going to take us down about a 5, and I don't think that's fair, because 5 is the dead average, and this is a little bit more than average. It's, it's charming enough to carry itself in its own weight. It's charming enough to, to pull itself a little bit out of the mire, but no Nazis? I mean, it just it doesn't. It boggles the mind. So I'm going to make the score a 6 out of 10. It's probably you know breaking the rules of video game reviewing, but I didn't really start caring. So remember, guys, don't believe what your teachers tell you. It's all lies. Last week's retrospective, we discussed Hideo Kojima's first true foray into video game development with the critically acclaimed Metal Gear games. However, Kojima's vision had not quite reached fruition, and upon seeing the PlayStation hardware for the first time, Kojima found a new avenue to continue the unfolding saga of series hero, Snake. After making seminal classic police noughts on Panasonic's 3DO, Kojima began hearing positive reports about the Sony's PlayStation hardware. After experiencing it for himself, Kojima began his work on Snake's newest adventure. Konami opened its Computer Entertainment Japan division specifically to supervise the project, and Kojima's debugger on the Police Noughts game, Yoji Shinkawa, would step up as the new project's art designer. In 1998, Hideo Kojima released Metal Gear Solid, Snake's first foray into 3D. Set six years after the events of Zanzibar Land, the game took place in 2005 on Shadow Moses Island. Snake, now codenamed Solid Snake, was called back from isolation once more to liberate a nuclear depot located there. The base had been seized by members of Foxhound, Colonel Campbell's former unit, and the Genome Soldiers, who had been altered genetically to enhance their abilities. Their demand was simple, the body of former antagonist Big Boss. Led by the treacherous former Foxhound leader Liquid Snake, they threatened to launch the nuclear arsenal they had acquired if their demand wasn't met. Snake had not only to stop Liquid's plans, he had to rescue two hostages, the DARPA chief and the president of Arms Tech, whom were both on the island at the time of its capture. He would also receive help in the form of a female soldier named Merrill and a brilliant engineer named Hal Emmerich, aka Otacom. This game is considered by many to be Kojima's masterpiece, with MGS going on to change the way people thought about storytelling through games. Lengthy cutscenes told Kojima's tale, complete with extensive voice acting. The gameplay mechanics were refined further, with the third dimension adding an extra facet to the stealth action. A corner cam was introduced, meaning Snake could check the path he was heading down before he entered it. Boss fights once again featured predominantly, with Snake once again fighting a variant of Metal Gear, along with the various members of Foxhound, each bringing varying challenges to the player. Of particular mention is the Psycho Mantis boss fight, in which Kojima went to great lengths to destroy the fourth wall and make the fight feel unique to the player. Metal Gear Solid asked as many questions as it answered with its story, with a running commentary on nuclear weapons, the nature of warfare, the concept of family and many more. Also, many of the characters would return in later incarnations of the franchise, with double crosses and secret agendas becoming the nature of the series. Kojima would later release the VR missions, an expansion disc containing a series of trials based in a virtual world that saw the player navigating through various locations to complete objectives. The VR missions were generally well received and added replayability to what was a heavy story-driven game. After all his success, however, 
Kojima was soon to learn the fickle nature of his audience, with his next project proving to be his most contentious game to date. 2001 saw the release of Metal Gear Solid 2, which arrived to much fanfare and anticipation. Trailers Sword and Snake engaged in massive battles in varying locales, and Konami even released a demo of the game with Kojima's Zone of the Enders. However, it didn't take long for many fans of Metal Gear Solid to cry foul at Kojima's most recent effort. The major point of contention was that Snake was not the only playable character, or indeed even the most predominant. After a brief mission with Snake, players were put into the shoes of Raiden, a fresh recruit who hadn't even set foot on the battlefield previously. His effeminate looks and churlish arrogance grated on many players who had expected to be once more in control of the series' long-running protagonist, Snake. The game took place in two locations, a tanker ship while in control of Snake and a decontamination plant while playing as Raiden. After Snake's mission, the tanker carrying the marine issue Metal Gear Ray was destroyed, leaving behind what was falsely claimed to be industrial waste in the middle of New York Harbour. A treatment centre was built on the site of the disaster, which two years on had been taken over by the dead cell, who had also managed to kidnap the US president, who was visiting the plant at the time. While Kojima alienated many of the fans with these developments, the game has provided many areas of discussion. MGS2 is seen as a distinctly postmodern game, with many themes attributed almost directly to that of the artistic style. The long and complicated cutscenes were made somewhat clearer when viewed with that style in mind, but it would be the events in the real world that would make the story in the game a lot harder to understand. 2001 was the year of the Twin Towers attacks, which was the largest ever attack on US soil. However, the original story of MGS2 saw many familiar New York landmarks destroyed as events unfolded. This caused Konami to remove a lot of the cutscenes so as not to offend the sensibilities of the Americans. This made what was already a difficult game to understand virtually impossible, adding to the grievances that blighted fans felt for MGS2. As far as gameplay goes, various other elements were introduced. The player could hold guards hostage by taking them by surprise. Refinements were made to the alert system, and for the first time players could go into first person mode, which aided with weapon accuracy and evasion. Lockers also added a new area for players to evade detection, or to hide the bodies of downed enemies. The boss fights were still an integral part of the experience, whilst not as memorable as previous iterations in the series, particularly the previous title, they were still considered by many to be fitting additions to the series. Whilst MGS2 had the customary Metal Gear battle, the player had to fight multiple Metal Gears while deep inside the corridors of a Metal Gear. This rather odd arrangement was explained in great detail in the final chapters of the game while alienating most fans even further with the plot twists presented in the game. Following MGS2, Kojima released MGS Twin Snakes, a retelling of MGS using the gameplay engine of MGS2. Released exclusively for the Nintendo GameCube, the voice work and cutscenes were all new and were directed by cult Japanese director Ryue Kitamura. After the furor surrounding Metal Gear Solid 2, Kojima opted for a more traditional storytelling experience for the next Metal Gear Solid game. 2004 brought Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater to the gaming world. Telling the story of Big Boss, aka Naked Snake, the game was set in 1964, making it a prequel to the Metal Gear saga. The gameplay in Snake Eater was vastly different from the previous games. The urban areas prevalent in other Metal Gear games were replaced with more natural environments, with jungles and deserts appearing alongside army bases and installations. The story in MGS3 was much more conventional than that of MGS2. The Cold War setting lent itself to a discussion on the nature of conflict, and Kojima also took this chance to lay the foundations for the story that would follow. Revolver Ocelot would also be introduced, becoming the first recurring character to have a major role in all the games of the Solid Saga. MGS3's Cold War setting would be carried over into Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops for Sony's PSP. Set seven years after MGS3, the game begins with Snake imprisoned in a Colombian jail. While there, he meets Roy Campbell, a fresh young Green Beret who is captured by the factions at work in South America. The major element introduced in this iteration was recruiting, whereby the player could take stunned enemy troops back to Snake's truck-bound base. 
where after some time being re-educated, could be used to aid Snake's cause. Thus ends our brief retrospective of the Metal Gear series. Kojima's works have been the subject of many debates centred on gaming, but his impact on in-game storytelling cannot be denied. And with Metal Gear Solid 4 set to end Snake's epic story, chances are Kojima will pull out all the stops to give Snake the send-off he deserves. There's been some good and some bad spy games out there. A lot of people like Splinter Cell. Jason disagrees. Uh, Perfect Dark on the N64, pretty good title. Um, of course, Goldeneye on the N64, great game. And Spy vs. Spy, I used to play that in the Commodore 64. And I'm sure our, our editor played it on the Amiga. Great game. Look it up if you haven't seen it. But now, Vivendi Studios has been given the title to make the Born Conspiracy game, and that's what I'm looking at today on your PlayStation 3. Now, I don't want to ruin the plot, because this game pretty much follows the movie almost exactly. So, you're a spy, you wake up, you're floating in the middle of the ocean, some Russian sailors have picked you up, and someone's trying to kill you, and you've got to work out who. Maybe it's... Ooh, some kind of conspiracy. I don't know. I don't want to spoil it. So Vivendi rings up Matt Damon. Hey Matt, um, can we just use your image in this game? Matt Damon's like, no, I have, a, I have something against video game violence. You're right, Matt. Our kids probably shouldn't be seeing so much violence. <laughs> But look, Vivendi's got this. Vivendi, in case you don't know, own, own Sierra and also Blizzard. So they've got all this money from, that they could use from World of Warcraft to pump into this and hopefully produce some absolute gold. And that's what I'm finding out today. The visuals on this one for me, look, they are a little sterile, but there, there is some detail in the environments there. The enemies all look pretty good and there's a decent range of them. You're not suffering with too many clones. The, the environment just didn't have that live, sort of gritty feeling that you get in a game. You do have a nice feeling of speed when your character's sprinting through. Uh, the guns look decent enough, but look, the visuals really are a mixed bag of good and bad for me. So I'm going to score the visuals on this one fairly harshly. Look, one thing that really did get to me though, I've got to say this before I dish out the score, they... When there's an important item, the item glows. Now, I just want to say right now, I think that as gamers, we should be past that. We don't need to have an item glow to be told it's important. I know it's part of the, the born instinct thing that they've got going in the game, but come on, let us use our own gamer instinct. I want to look around and decide what's important, not have some editor make something glow and tell me what's important. Of course, our editor thinks uh, this is important. Hmm. <clears throat> so the graphics on this one, I'm only going to score at a 5 out of 10. But the sound is a completely different thing in this game. Every game designer out there should be listening to the gun sound effects on this one. You can hear the entire mechanism of the gun when you fire. Sounds absolutely fantastic and you are going to feel scared when you hear the clicking of an empty magazine in the middle of a firefight. You'll be running for cover. Really good. The sound does so much and picks up to make a lot of the atmosphere where the visuals just don't do it for you. So the sound on this one, the voice acting, pretty darn good as well. Uh, it's great creeping up, 
sneaking up to enemies and listening into their conversations. Yeah, it's, it feels kind of heavily scripted, but still it sounds good and adds to the whole thing. So I did enjoy the sound on this one and gets a massive eight out of 10. Those gun sound effects are on par with any other gun sound effects that I've heard in games of late. And the gameplay, of course, for me is probably the most significant element of this game. The gameplay, it, it feels very, very stilted. The character's hard to move around. Uh, the cover system is very sluggish. In a lot of shooter games now, they're actually allowing you to run and slide into cover. And this is what this game really needed. So I couldn't, I couldn't use the cover system very well. The character's movements were very difficult and the game's extremely directed. So if you've got to walk down a path, you can only go one way. And that's just, that's just annoying to me these days. We need to, you, you should have been able to jump off the docks and swim for a little bit if you wanted to and, and get around enemies or take them down you just couldn't. But the other major thing is the game just didn't make sense at some points. There's a, there's a point where you're running across the top of buildings and snipers are firing at you. So of course you're running like all buggery because you know they're trying to take you out. Then there's a guy up on top of the building. You stop and have a fist fight with him. And, and the snipers just don't fire at you then. That's just doesn't make any sense. If I was that sniper, I'd risk my, my other dude's life to take you out. Of course I would. Also, if you're in a fist fight, it is a fist fight. There's nothing else to it. You're not permitted to step back and draw your weapon out and shoot. So the game really heavily directs you what to do. And I think that that's something that's just out of date in gaming today. The other thing is it's got instances. Now, instances are, are a cutscene that plays and you have to press a button or a direction when it tells you to very quickly so that you can either either succeed or fail in the instance and it's just such an outdated thing to do. I don't really think that it has a place in gaming anymore. It's not fun, it takes control of the gamer and it just takes away from the game experience. So look, I can only score the gameplay on this one at a 4 out of 10. Look, overall this game is going to be dragged down to a 5 out of 10. I. I just didn't feel like I was immersed in the experience. You know what? You may as well just watch the movie. Look, if you catch yourself playing this game and there's no way out, use this. It's, it's got to be better than playing the game. That's my review for today, guys. Thanks for watching. And there you have it, Born Conspiracy, our wardrobe department obviously working overtime and the special effects department. So, I didn't think it was too flash. What did you think? You played it? Oh, okay. A so-so from Jason. There we go. And here we are at the end of another episode of Level 3. Don't forget, on the 18th, we will be appearing at the Clayton Library. <laughs> the IRC chats as normal. Go to the forums, check out our website. And if you do know anyone who deserves a gamer award, drop me an email, jamie at level3.org.au. And that's it. We're going to have a special treat for this episode, actually. We're going to have our usual game on. It's going to be said by this guy. Okay. He can't do it because he has laryngitis. Um, myself and the crew probably found that more amusing than anyone else. So until next time, game on. It's a weird kid's birthday. Would you rather go bowling? Or steal a septic truck and spray loads of sewage on pedestrians? Would you rather go to the cabaret with a friend? Or inflict serious bodily injuries to your friend to earn a little insurance money? Would you rather watch TV within the game you're playing on your TV? Or dress up like a cop and rob a liquor store? Streak in public? Join an illegal fight league? or run security for local celebrities, or base jump, car surf, trailblaze, compete in demolition derbies, barnstorm, or tons of all new activities that totally kick ass? Now we know you're out there doing those other things right now, and that's fine. But when you're done, we'll be right here, doing some crazy shit.